This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Economy Anarchism is opposed to capitalism and to private ownership of the tools, infrastructure, and resources everyone requires for sustenance. Anarchist economic models range from hunter-gatherer communities and agricultural communes to industrial complexes in which planning is carried out by syndicates and distribution is arranged through quotas or a limited form of currency. All these models are based on the principles of working together to fulfill common needs and rejecting hierarchy of all kinds, including bosses, management, and the division of society into classes such as wealthy and poor, or owners and laborers. Without wages, what is the incentive to work? Some worry that if we abolish capitalism and wage labor, no one will work anymore. It is true that work as it exists now for most people would cease to exist. But work that is socially useful offers a number of incentives besides the paycheck. If anything, getting paid to do something makes it less enjoyable. The alienation of labor that is part of capitalism destroys natural incentives to work, such as the pleasure of acting freely and the satisfaction of a job well done. When work puts us in a position of inferiority to the boss who oversees us and the wealthy people who own our workplace, and we do not have decision-making power in our job but must mindlessly follow orders, it can become excruciatingly odious and mind-numbing. We also lose our natural incentive to work when we are not doing something that is useful for our communities. Of the few workers today who are lucky enough to actually produce something they can see, they are nearly all making something that is profitable to their employers, but completely meaningless to them personally. The Fordist, or assembly line structuring of labor, turns people into machines. Instead of cultivating skills workers can be proud of, it proves more cost-effective to give each person a single repetitive task and put him or her on an assembly line. No wonder so many workers sabotage or steal from their workplaces or show up with an automatic weapon and, quote, go postal. The idea that without wages people would stop working is baseless. In the broad timeline of human history, wages are a fairly recent invention. Yet societies that have existed without currency or wages did not starve to death, just because no one paid the workers. With the abolition of wage labor, only the kind of work that no one can justify to himself as useful would disappear. All the time and resources put into making all the useless crap that our society is drowning in would be saved. Think of how much of our resources and labor go into advertising, mass mailings, throwaway packaging, cheap toys, disposable goods, things no one takes pride in making, designed to fall apart in a short time so you have to buy the next version. Indigenous societies with less division of labor had no problem doing without wages, because the primary economic activities, producing food, housing, clothing, tools, are all easily connected to common needs. In such circumstances, work is a necessary social activity, and an apparent obligation from every member of the community who is able. And because it takes place in a flexible personal setting, work can be adapted to every individual's capabilities and there is nothing to keep people from transforming work into play. Fixing up your house, hunting, wandering in the woods, identifying plants and animals, knitting, cooking a feast. Aren't these the things that bored middle-class people do in their leisure hours to forget their loathsome jobs for a moment? Anti-capitalist societies with greater economic specialization have developed a variety of methods for providing incentives and distributing the products of workers' labor. The aforementioned Israeli kibbutzim offer one example of incentives to work in the absence of wages. One book documenting life and work in a kibbutz identifies four major motivations to work within the cooperative labor teams, which lacked individual competition and profit motive. Group productivity affects the whole community's standard of living, so there is group pressure to work hard. Members work where they choose and gain satisfaction from their work. People develop a competitive pride if their branch of work does better than other branches. People gain prestige from work because labor is a cultural value. As described above, the ultimate decline of the kibbutz experiment stemmed largely from the fact that the kibbutzim were socialist enterprises competing within a capitalist economy. 
and thus subsumed to the logic of competition rather than the logic of mutual aid. A similarly organized commune in a world without capitalism would not face these same problems. In any case, unwillingness to work due to lack of wages was not one of the problems the kibbutzim faced. Many anarchists suggest that the germs of capitalism are contained in the mentality of production itself. Whether a given type of economy can survive, much less grow, within capitalism is a poor measure of its liberatory potential. But anarchists propose and debate many different forms of economy, some of which can only be practiced to a limited extent because they are wholly illegal within today's world. In the European squatters movement, some cities have had or continue to have so many squatted social centers and houses that they constitute a shadow society. In Barcelona, for example, as recently as 2008, there were over 40 occupied social centers and at least 200 squatted houses. The collectives of people who inhabit these squats generally use consensus and group assemblies, and most are explicitly anarchist or intentionally anti-authoritarian. To a large extent, work and exchange have been abolished from these people's lives, whose networks run into the thousands. Many do not have wage jobs, or they work only seasonally or sporadically, as they do not need to pay rent. For example, the author of this book, who has lived within this network for two years, has survived for much of that time on less than one euro a day. Moreover, the great amount of activity they carry out within the autonomous movement is completely unwaged. But they do not need wages. They work for themselves. They occupy abandoned buildings left to rot by speculators, as a protest against gentrification, and as anti-capitalist direct action to provide themselves with housing. Teaching themselves the skills they need along the way, they fix up their new houses, cleaning, patching roofs, installing windows, toilets, showers, light kitchens, and anything else they need. They often pirate electricity, water, and internet, and much of their food comes from dumpster diving, stealing, and squatted gardens. In the total absence of wages or managers, they carry on a great deal of work, but at their own pace and logic. The logic is one of mutual aid. Besides fixing up their own houses, they also direct their energies towards working for their neighborhoods and enriching their communities. They provide for many of their collective needs besides housing. Some social centers host bicycle repair workshops, enabling people to repair or build their own bicycles, using old parts. Others offer carpentry workshops, self-defense and yoga workshops, natural healing workshops, libraries, gardens, communal meals, art and theater groups, language classes, alternative media and counter-information, music shows, movies, computer labs where people can use the internet and learn email security or host their own websites, and solidarity events to deal with the inevitable repression. Nearly all of these services are provided absolutely free. There is no exchange. One group organizes to provide a service to everyone, and the entire social network benefits. With an astounding amount of initiative in such a passive society, Squatters regularly get the idea to organize a communal meal, or a bicycle repair shop, or a weekly movie showing. They talk with friends and friends of friends until they have enough people and resources to make their idea a reality. And then they spread the word or put up posters and hope as many people as possible will come and partake. To a capitalist mentality, they are avidly inviting people to rob them. But the squatters never stop to question activities that don't put money in their pockets. It is evident that they have created a new form of wealth, and sharing what they make themselves clearly makes them richer. The surrounding neighborhoods also become richer, as the squatters take the initiative to create projects much quicker than the local government could. In the magazine of a neighborhood association in Barcelona, they praised a local squat for responding to a neighborhood demand the government had been ignoring for years, building the neighborhood a library. A mainstream news magazine remarked, quote, the squatters do the work the district forgets about, end quote. In that same neighborhood, the squatters proved to be a powerful ally to a rent-paying neighbor who was being pressured out by a landlord. The squatters worked tirelessly with an association of old folks who were facing similar situations of chicanery and illegal eviction by landlords, and they stopped the eviction of their neighbor. In a trend that seems common to the total abolition of work, the social and the economic blend to become indistinguishable. Labor and services are not valorized or given a dollar value. They are social activities that are carried out individually or collectively as a part of daily life without any need for accounting or management. 
The result is that in cities such as Barcelona, people can spend the majority of their time and meet the majority of their needs, from housing to entertainment, within the squatter social network, without labor and almost without money. Of course, not everything can be stolen. Not yet. And the squatters are still compelled to sell their labor to pay for things like medical care and court costs. But for many people, the exceptional nature of those things that cannot be self-produced, scavenged, or stolen, the outrage of having to sell valuable moments of one's life to work for some corporation, can have the effect of increasing the level of conflict with capitalism. One potential pitfall of any movement powerful enough to create an alternative to capitalism is that its participants can easily become complacent, living in their bubble of autonomy, and lose the will to fight for the total abolition of capitalism. Squatting itself can easily become a ritual, and in Barcelona, the movement as a whole has not applied the same creativity to resistance and attack as it has to many of the practical aspects of fixing up houses and finding subsistence with little or no money. The self-sustaining nature of the network of squatters, the immediate presence of freedom, initiative, pleasure, independence, and community in their lives have by no means destroyed capitalism but they do reveal it to be a walking corpse, with nothing but the police in the end preventing it from becoming extinct and being replaced by far superior forms of living. Don't people need bosses and experts? How can anarchists organize themselves in the workplace and coordinate production and distribution across an entire economy without bosses and managers? In fact, a great deal of resources are lost through competition and middlemen. Ultimately, it is the workers who carry out all the production and distribution, and they know how to coordinate their own work in the absence of bosses. In and around Turin, Italy, 500,000 workers participated in a factory takeover movement after World War I. Communists, anarchists, and other workers who were pissed off at their exploitation launched wildcat strikes many of them eventually gaining control of their factories and setting up factory councils to coordinate their activities. They were able to run the factories themselves without bosses. Eventually, the councils were legalized and legislated out of existence, in part co-opted and absorbed into the labor unions, whose institutional existence was threatened by autonomous workers' power no less than the owners were. In December 2001, a long-brewing economic crisis in Argentina matured into a run on the banks, which precipitated a major popular rebellion. Argentina had been the poster child of neoliberal institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund. But the policies that enriched foreign investors and gave middle-class Argentinians a first-world lifestyle created an acute poverty for much of the country. Anti-capitalist resistance was already widely developed among the unemployed. And after the middle class lost all its savings, millions of people took to the streets, rejecting all the false solutions and excuses offered by politicians, economists, and the media, declaring instead, que se vayan todos, they all must go. Dozens were killed by police, but people fought back, shaking off the terror left over from the military dictatorship that ruled Argentina in the 70s and 80s. Hundreds of factories, abandoned by their owners, were occupied by workers who resumed production so they could continue to feed their families. The more radical of these worker-occupied factories equalized wages and shared managerial duties among all workers. They made decisions in open meetings, and some workers taught themselves tasks such as accounting. To ensure that a new managerial class did not arise, some factories rotated managerial tasks or required that people in managerial roles still work on the factory floor and perform the accounting, marketing, and other tasks after hours. As of this writing, several of these occupied workplaces have been able to expand their workforce and hire additional workers from Argentina's huge unemployed population. In some cases, occupied factories trade needed supplies and products with one another, creating a shadow economy in a spirit of solidarity. One of the most famous, the Zanon Ceramics Factory located in southern Argentina, was shut down by the owner in 2001, 
occupied by its workers the following January. They began running the factory with an open assembly and commissions made up of workers to manage sales, administration, planning, security, hygiene and sanitation, purchasing, production, diffusion, and press. Following the occupation, they rehired workers who had been fired before the closing. As of 2004, they numbered 270 workers and produced at 50% of the production rate before the factory was closed. Bringing doctors and psychologists on site, they provided themselves with health care. The workers found that they could pay their workforce with just two days of production, so they lowered prices 60% and organized a network of young vendors, many previously unemployed, to market the ceramic tiles throughout the city. In addition to producing tiles, the Zenon factory involves itself with social movements, donating money to hospitals and schools, selling tiles at cost to poor people, hosting films, performances, and art shows, and carrying out solidarity actions with other struggles. They also support the Mapuche struggle for autonomy, and when their clay supplier stopped doing business with them for political reasons, the Mapuche began supplying clay. As of April 2003, the factory had faced four attempted evictions by the police, with the support of the trade unions. All were forcefully resisted by the workers, assisted by neighbors, piqueteros, and others. In July 2001, the workers of the El Tigre supermarket in Rosario, Argentina, occupied their workplace. The owner had shut it down two months earlier and declared bankruptcy, still owing his employees months in wages. After fruitless protesting, the workers opened El Tigre and began running it themselves through an assembly that allowed all workers a part in decision-making. In a spirit of solidarity, they lowered prices and began selling fruit and vegetables from a local farmer's cooperative and products made in other occupied factories. They also used part of their space to open a cultural center for the neighborhood, housing political talks, student groups, theater and yoga workshops, puppet shows, a cafe, and a library. In 2003, El Tigre's Cultural Center held the National Meeting of Reclaimed Businesses, attended by 1,500 people. Maria, one collective member, said of her experience, quote, Three years ago, if someone had told me we'd be able to run this place, I'd never have believed them. I believe we needed bosses to tell us what to do. Now I realize that together, we can do it better than them. End quote. In Escalaria, the Basque country owned by the states of Spain and France, a large complex of cooperative worker-owned businesses has arisen, centered around the small city of Mondragon. Starting with 23 workers and one cooperative in 1956, the Mondragon cooperatives included 19,500 workers and over 100 cooperatives by 1986, surviving despite the heavy recession in Spain at the time, and with a survival rate many times better than the average for capitalist firms. Quote, Mandragon has had a rich experience over many years in manufacturing products as varied as furniture, kitchen equipment, machine tools, and electronic components, and in printing, shipbuilding, and metal smelting. Mandragon has created hybrid cooperatives composed of both consumers and workers, and of farmers and workers. The complex has developed its own social security cooperative and a cooperative bank that is growing more rapidly than any other bank in the Basque provinces, unquote. The highest authority in the Mondragon cooperatives is the General Assembly, with each worker member getting one vote. The specific management of the cooperative is carried out by an elected governing council, which is advised by a management council and a social council. There are also many criticisms of the Mondragon complex. To anarchists, it comes as no surprise that a democratic structure can house an elite group, and according to Mondragon's critics, this is exactly what has happened as the cooperative complex seeks and achieves success within a capitalist economy. Although their accomplishment is impressive and gives lie to the assumption that large industries must be organized hierarchically, the compulsion to be profitable and competitive has pushed the cooperatives to manage their own exploitation. For example, after decades of sticking by their egalitarian founding principles regarding pay scales, eventually the Mondragon cooperatives decided to increase the salaries of the managerial and technical experts relative to the manual workers. Their reason was that they had a hard time retaining people who could receive much higher pay for their skills 
in a corporation. This problem indicates a need to mix manual and intellectual tasks to avoid the professionalization of expertise, i.e. creating expertise as a quality restricted to an elite few, and to build an economy in which people are producing not for profit, but for other members of the network, so money loses its importance and people work out of a sense of community and solidarity. People in today's high-tech societies are trained to believe that examples from the past or from the quote-unquote underdeveloped world have no value for our situation today. Many people who consider themselves educated sociologists and economists dismiss the Montragon example by classifying Basque culture as exceptional. But there are other examples of the efficacy of egalitarian workplaces, even in the heart of capitalism. Gore Associates, based in Delaware, is the billion-dollar high-tech firm that produces waterproof Gore-Tex fabric, special insulation for computer cables, and parts for the medical, automobile, and semiconductor industries. Salaries are determined collectively. No one has titles. There is no formal management structure, and differentiation between employees is minimized. By all capitalist standards of performance, employee turnover, profitability, product reputation, lists of best companies to work for, Gore is a success. An important factor in their success is adherence to what some academics call the Rule of 150. Based on the observation that hunter-gatherer groups around the world, as well as successful communities and intentional communes, seem to keep their size between 100 and 150 people, the theory is that the human brain is best equipped to navigate webs of personal relationships of up to 150. Maintaining intimate relationships, remembering names and social status and established codes of conduct and communication. All this takes up mental space. Just as other primates tend to live in groups up to a certain size, human beings are probably best suited to keep up with a certain number of companions. All gore factories keep their size below 150 employees, so each plant can be entirely self-managing, not just on the factory floor, but also including the people responsible for marketing, research, and other tasks. Skeptics often dismiss the anarchistic example of small-scale, quote-unquote, primitive societies by arguing that it's no longer possible to organize on such a small scale, given the huge population. But there is nothing to stop a large society from organizing itself in many smaller units. Even within a high-tech industry, gore factories can coordinate with one another and with suppliers and consumers while maintaining their small-scale organizational structure. Just as each unit is capable of organizing its internal relations, each is capable of organizing its external relations. Of course, the example of a factory producing successfully within the capitalist system leaves much to be desired. Most anarchists would sooner see all factories burned to the ground than anti-authoritarian forms of organization used to sugarcoat capitalism. But this example should at least demonstrate that even within a large and complex society, self-organization works. The example of Gore is still problematic because the workers do not own the factory, and also because formal management could be reimposed at any time by the company owners. Anarchists theorize that the problems of capitalism do not exist only in the relationship between workers and owners, but also between workers and managers, and that as long as the manager-worker relationship persists, capitalism can reemerge. This theory is certainly borne out by the Mondragon example, where over time managers gained more pay and power and renewed the unequal profit-focused dynamics typical of capitalism. Taking this into account, Several anarchists have designed an outline for a participatory economy, quote-unquote, or pericon, though no one has yet had the opportunity to set up such an economy on any considerable scale. Among other things, pericon emphasizes the importance of empowering all workers by mixing tasks that are creative and rote, mental and manual, thus creating, quote-unquote, balanced job complexes that will prevent the emergence of a managerial class. During the rebellion in Oaxaca in 2006, people without prior experience organized themselves to run occupied radio and television stations. They were motivated by the social need for free means of communication. The March of Pots and Pans, the legendary women's march on August 1, 2006, culminated with thousands of women spontaneously taking over the state-run television station. 
Inspired by the sudden sense of power they had won by rebelling against a traditionally patriarchal society, they took over Channel 9, which continuously slandered the social movement while claiming to be the channel of the people. At first, they made the engineers help them run the station, but soon they were learning how to do it themselves. One woman recounted, quote, I went daily to the channel to stand guard and help out. The women were organized into different commissions, food, hygiene, production, and security. One thing I liked is that there were no individual leaders. For every task, there was a group of several women in charge. We learned everything from the beginning. I remember somebody asking, who could use a computer? Then many of the younger girls stepped forward, saying, me, me, I can. In Radio Universidad, they announced that we needed more people with technical skills. And more people came to help. In the beginning, they were filming headless people, you know. But the experience at Channel 9 showed us that where there's a will, there's a way. Things got done, and they got done well. In the short time, three weeks, that Channel 9 was running, until Governor Ulysses commanded that the antennas be destroyed, we managed to spread a lot of information. Movies and documentaries were shown that you could never have imagined seeing on TV otherwise, about different social movements, about the student massacre in Tlatelolco in Mexico City in 1968, the massacres in Aguablancas in Guerrero and Acteal in Chiapas, about guerrilla movements in Cuba and El Salvador. At this time, Channel 9 wasn't just the women's channel anymore. It was the channel of all the people. The ones participating made their own programs as well. There was a youth program and a program where people from the indigenous communities participated. There was a program of denouncements where anyone could come and denounce how the government had treated them. A lot of people from the different neighborhoods and communities wanted to participate, and there was hardly enough airtime for all of them. Unquote. After the occupied television station was taken off the air, the movement responded by occupying all 11 commercial radio stations in Oaxaca. The homogeneity of commercial radio was replaced by myriad voices, a radio station for university students, one for the women's groups, one radio station occupied by the anarchists from a punk squad, and there were more indigenous voices on the radio than ever before. Within a short time, people in the movement decided to return most of the radio stations to their self-styled owners, but kept control of two of them. Their goal was not to suppress the voices that opposed them, as artificial as commercial voices are, but to win themselves the means to communicate. The remaining radio stations operated successfully for months until government repression shut them down. One university student involved in taking over, running, and defending the radio station said, quote, After the takeover, I read an article that said the intellectual and material authors of the takeovers of the radios weren't Oaxacan, that they came from somewhere else, and that they received very specialized support. It's said that it would have been impossible for anyone without previous training to operate the radios in such a short amount of time, because the equipment is too sophisticated for just anyone to use. They were wrong. Unquote. Who will take out the trash? If everyone is free to work as they choose, who will take out the trash or perform other undesirable jobs? Fortunately, in a localized, anti-capitalist economy, we could not externalize or hide the costs of our lifestyle by paying someone else to clean up after us. To have to pay for the consequences of all our own actions, rather than paying China to take our toxic waste, for example. If a necessary service like garbage disposal were being neglected, the community would quickly notice and have to decide how to handle the problem. People could agree to reward such work with small perks, Nothing that translates into power or authority, but something like getting to be first in line when exotic goods come into town, receiving a massage or a cake, or simply the recognition and gratitude for being a stand-up member of the community. Ultimately, in a cooperative society, having a good reputation and being seen by your peers as responsible are more compelling than any material incentives. Or the community could decide that everyone should involve themselves in these tasks on a rotating basis. An activity like garbage collection does not have to define anyone's quote-unquote career in an anti-capitalist economy. Necessary tasks no one wants to perform should be shared by everyone. So instead of a few people having to sort through garbage their entire lives, everyone who is physically able would have to do it for just a couple hours each month. The Christiania Free State is a quarter in Copenhagen, Denmark, that has been squatted since 1971. Its 850 inhabitants are autonomous within their 85 acres. They have been taking out their own trash for over 30 years. 
The fact that they receive about 1 million visitors a year makes their achievement all the more impressive. The streets, buildings, restaurants, public toilets, and public showers are all reasonably clean, especially for hippies. The body of water that runs through the Christiania is not the cleanest, but considering that Christiania is tree-covered and automobile-free, one suspects most of the pollution comes from the surrounding city that shares the waterway. Residents have built dozens of the houses now standing in Christiania using innovative eco-design. They also use, quote, solar power, wind power, composting, and a whole host of other eco-friendly innovations. A method of filtering sewage through reed beds, which means water coming out of Christiania is as clean as that coming out from the rest of Copenhagen's treatment plants, has helped the commune be shortlisted for a pan-Scandinavian award for ecological living, unquote. Different people interviewed had different conceptions of how Christiania was kept clean, suggesting a sort of dual system. A newcomer said that you cleaned up after yourself, and when you felt like doing some extra picking up, you did. An old-time resident who was more involved in decision-making explained that there was a garbage committee, answerable to the common meeting, responsible for the bottom line of keeping Christiania clean, though clearly voluntary assistance and cleanliness by all the residents was the first line of defense. Who will take care of the elderly and disabled? Only in a society with what is euphemistically termed a quote-unquote highly competitive market are elderly people and disabled people so marginalized. In order to increase profit margins, employers avoid hiring people with disabilities and force older workers into early retirement. When workers are compelled to move frequently in search of jobs in a culture in which the rite of passage to adulthood is moving into your own house, parents are left alone as they age. Most eventually move into whatever kind of retirement facility they can afford. Many die neglected, alone, and indignant, perhaps with bed sores and diapers that have not been changed in two days. In an anarchist, anti-capitalist world, the social fabric would not be so coarse. In the plethora of experiments that arose in Argentina in response to the crisis of 2001, the economics of solidarity and care for all members of society flourished. The economic collapse in Argentina did not lead to the dog-eat-dog -dog scenario that capitalists fear. Rather, the result was an explosion of solidarity, and the elderly and disabled have not been left out of this web of mutual aid. In participating in the neighborhood assemblies, elderly and disabled people in Argentina got the chance to secure their own needs and represent themselves in the decisions that would affect their lives. At some assemblies, participants suggested that those who own their houses withhold property tax and instead give that money to the local hospital or other care facilities. In parts of Argentina with severe unemployment, movements of unemployed workers have effectively taken over and are building new economies. In General Masconi, an oil town in the north, unemployment is above 40%, and the area is largely autonomous. The movement has organized over 300 projects to see to people's needs, including those of the elderly and disabled. Even in the absence of stored wealth or fixed infrastructure, stateless hunter-gatherer societies generally take care of all the members of their community, regardless of whether they are economically productive. In fact, grandparents, generally useless from a Darwinist point of view since they are past the age of reproduction, are a defining characteristic of humankind going back millions of years, and the fossil record from the beginning of our species shows that the elderly were cared for. Modern hunter-gatherers demonstrate not only material care for the elderly, but also something that is invisible in the fossil record, respect. The Mbuti, for example, recognize five age groups, infants, children, youth, adults, and elders. And of these, only the adults carry out significant economic production in the form of gathering and hunting or collecting raw materials like wood. Yet social wealth is shared by all regardless of their productivity. It would be unthinkable to let the elderly or disabled starve simply because they do not work. Likewise, the Muti include all members of their society in making decisions and participating in political and social life and the elderly play a special role in conflict resolution and peacemaking. Footnote number 10. Regarding the genetic usefulness from a Darwinist point of view and the age of reproduction. 
Technically, human elders provide a reproductive function because they store obscure types of information, like how to survive natural disasters that only occur once every several generations. And they can also serve to increase social cohesion by increasing the amount of living relations within the community. For example, the number of people with the same grandparents is much larger than the number of people with the same parents. However, these survival benefits are not immediately obvious, and there is no evidence of any human society making such calculations when deciding whether or not to feed their toothless grannies. In other words, the fact that we avail ourselves of the benefits of the elderly is a reflection of our habitual social generosity. How will people get healthcare? Capitalists and bureaucrats see healthcare as an industry, a way to extort money from people in need, and also as a way to appease a population and prevent rebellion. It's no surprise that the quality of the healthcare often suffers. In the richest country in the world, millions have no access to healthcare, including this author. And every year, hundreds of thousands of people die from preventable or treatable diseases. Since poisonous working and living conditions and lack of health care have always been major grievances within capitalism, providing health care is generally a chief goal of anti-capitalist revolutionaries. For example, unemployed people in neighborhood assemblies in Argentina commonly set up clinics to take over and fund existing hospitals left defunct by the state. During the Spanish Civil War, Barcelona's medical syndicate, organized largely by anarchists, managed 18 hospitals, six of which it had created. 17 sanatoria, 22 clinics, 6 psychiatric establishments, 3 nurseries, and 1 maternity hospital. Outpatient departments were set up in all the principal localities in Catalonia. Upon receiving a request, the syndicate sent doctors to places in need. The doctor would have to give good reason for refusing the post, quote-unquote, for it was considered that medicine was at the service of the community and not the other way around. Funds for outpatient clinics came from contributions from local municipalities. The Anarchist Health Workers Union included 8,000 health workers, 1,020 of them doctors, and also 3,206 nurses, 133 dentists, 330 midwives, and 153 herbalists. The union operated 36 health centers distributed throughout Catalonia to provide health care to everyone in the entire region. There was a central syndicate in each of nine zones. And in Barcelona, a control committee composed of one delegate from each section met once a week to deal with common problems and implement a common plan. Every department was autonomous in its own sphere, but not isolated, as they supported one another. Beyond Catalonia, health care was provided for free in agrarian collectives throughout Aragon and the Levant. Even in the nascent anarchist movement in the U.S. today, anarchists are taking steps to learn about and provide health care. In some communities, anarchists are learning alternative medicine and providing it for their communities. And at major protests, given the likelihood of police violence, anarchists organize networks of volunteer medics who set up first aid stations and organize roving medics to provide first aid for thousands of demonstrators. These medics, often self-trained, treat injuries from pepper spray, tear gas, clubs, tasers, rubber bullets, police horses, and more, as well as shock and trauma. The Boston Area Liberation Medic Squad, Balm Squad, is an example of a medic group that organizes on a permanent basis. Formed in 2001, they travel to major protests in other cities as well, and hold trainings for emergency first aid. They run a website, share information, and link to other initiatives, such as the Common Ground Clinic described below. They are non-hierarchical and use consensus decision-making, as does the Bay Area Radical Health Collective, a similar group on the West Coast. Between protests, a number of radical feminist groups throughout the U.S. and Canada have formed women's health collectives to address the needs of women. Some of these collectives teach female anatomy in empowering, positive ways, showing women how to give themselves gynecological exams, how to experience menstruation comfortably, and how to practice safe methods of birth control. The patriarchal Western medical establishment is generally ignorant of women's health to the point of being degrading and harmful. An anti-establishment, do-it-yourself approach allows marginalized people to subvert a neglectful system by organizing to meet their own needs. After Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans, activist street medics joined a former Black Panther in setting up the Common Ground Clinic in one of the neediest neighborhoods. They were soon assisted by hundreds of anarchists and other volunteers from across the country, 
mostly without experience. Funded by donations and run by volunteers, the Common Ground Clinic provided treatment to tens of thousands of people. The failure of the government's quote-unquote emergency management experts during the crisis is widely recognized. But Common Ground was so well organized it also outperformed the Red Cross, despite the latter having a great deal more experience and resources. In the process, they popularized the concept of mutual aid and made plain the failure of the government. At the time of this writing, Common Ground has 40 full-time organizers and is pursuing health in a much broader sense, also making community gardens and fighting for housing rights so that those evicted by the storm will not be prevented from coming home by the gentrification plans of the government. They have helped gut and rebuild many houses in the poorest neighborhoods, which authorities wanted to bulldoze in order to win more living space for rich white people. What about education? Education has long been a priority of anarchist and other revolutionary movements around the world. But even if people completely neglected the organization of education after the revolution, that would still be an improvement over the patriotic, degrading, manipulative, and mind-numbing forms of education sponsored by the nation-state. Like everyone else, children are capable of educating themselves, and are often motivated to do so in the proper setting. But public schools rarely offer that setting, nor do they educate the students on topics of immediate usefulness, like surviving childhood, expressing emotions healthily, developing their unique creative potentials, taking charge of their own health or caring for sick people, dealing with gender violence, domestic abuse, or alcoholism, standing up to bullies, communicating with parents, exploring their sexuality in a respectful way, finding a job, an apartment, or making do without money or other skills young people need to live. In the few classes that teach useful hands-on skills, nearly always electives, students are quote-unquote tracked. Girls learn how to cook and sew in home ec, boys likely to go on to blue-collar jobs learn woodworking and shop. It is safe to say that most boys finish high school ignorant of how to cook or patch up their clothes, and most girls and future white-collar workers graduate not knowing how to fix a toilet, mount an electrical installation, repair a bicycle or a car engine, plaster a wall, or work with wood. And in the computer and technology classes, the fact that students often know more than the teachers is a clear indication that something is wrong with this form of education. Schools do not even teach kids the skills they need for the crappy jobs they will end up working. Most of this, people teach themselves, or learn among friends and peers. That is to say, the school of life is already anarchistic. The most important lessons consistently taught by schools under the state are to obey arbitrary authority, to accept the imposition of other people's priorities on our lives, and to stop daydreaming. When children start school, they are self-guided, curious about the world they live in, and believe everything is possible. When they finish, they are cynical, self-absorbed, and used to dedicating 40 hours of their week to an activity they never chose. They are also likely to be miseducated about a number of things, perhaps unaware that a majority of human societies throughout history have been egalitarian and stateless, that the police have only recently become an important and supposedly necessary institution, that their government has a track record of torture, genocide, and repression, that their lifestyles are destroying the environment, that their food and water are poisoned, or that there is a history of resistance waiting to be uncovered in their very own town. This systematic miseducation is hardly surprising, given the history of public schools. Though public schools developed gradually from an array of precedents, the regime of Otto von Bismarck is widely credited with first establishing a national public school system. The purpose was to prepare youth for careers in the bureaucracy or military discipline them, instill them with patriotism and indoctrinate them in the culture and history of a German nation that had not previously existed. The school system was one of the modernizations that allowed a collection of bickering provinces, some of them practically feudal, to form a state that could threaten the rest of the continent and large parts of Africa within a generation. In response, a number of anarchist theorists set out to design non-hierarchical schools in which teachers would serve as aides helping the students learn and explore their chosen subjects. Some of these anarchist experiments in education in the U.S. were called modern schools, on the model of Spanish anarchist Francisco Ferrer's Escuela Moderna. These schools helped educate thousands of students and played important roles in the anarchist and labor movements. In 1911, shortly after Ferrer's execution in Spain, 
The first modern school in the U.S. was founded in New York City by Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, Voltaire de Clare, and other anarchists. A number of famous artists and writers helped teach there, and pupils included the artist Man Ray. It lasted for several decades, eventually moving out of New York City during a period of intense political repression and became the center of a rural commune. More recently, anarchists and other activists in the U.S. have organized quote-unquote free schools. Some of these are temporary, ad hoc classes, while some are fully organized schools. One, the Albany Free School, has existed for over 32 years in inner-city Albany. This anti-authoritarian school is committed to social justice as well as education. It offers sliding-scale tuition and turns no one away for financial reasons. Most experimental schools are only accessible to the elite, but the student body of the Albany Free School is diverse, including many inner-city kids from poor families. The school has no curriculum or compulsory classes, operating according to the philosophy, quote, trust children and they will learn. Because when you entrust kids with their own so-called quote-unquote education, which is not a thing after all, but rather an ever-present action, they will learn continually, each in their own way and rhythm, end quote. The free school teaches children up to the eighth grade and has recently opened a high school, the Harriet Tubman Free School. The school organizes a small organic farm in the city, which provides another important learning opportunity for students. Students also work with community service projects, such as soup kitchens and daycare centers. Despite financial and other limitations, they have succeeded admirably. Quote, Our reputation with students that are struggling academically and or behaviorally, and whose needs the system has failed to meet, is such that an increasing number of kids are coming to us having previously been tagged with labels like ADHD and placed on Ritalin and other biopsychiatric medications. Their parents seek us out because they're concerned about the side effects of the drugs, and because they've heard that we work effectively with these children without drugs of any kind. Our active, flexible, individually structured environment renders the drugs entirely unnecessary." Unquote. The MST, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, has focused ardently on education in the settlements they have created on occupied land. Between 2002 and 2005, the MST claims to have taught over 50,000 landless workers how to read. 150,000 children are enrolled in 1,200 different schools they have built on their settlements, and they have also trained over 1,000 educators. The MST schools are free from state control, so communities have the power to decide what their children are taught and can develop alternative methods of education as well as curricula free of the racist, patriotic, and capitalist values that are part and parcel of public education. The Brazilian government complains that children in the settlements are taught that genetically modified crops pose a risk to human health in the environment, which suggests that they get a much more relevant and accurate education than their peers in the state-run schools. MST schools in the settlements focus on literacy and use the methods of Paulo Freire, who developed the quote-unquote pedagogy of the oppressed. In Sao Paulo, the MST has built itself an autonomous university which trains farmers nominated by the individual settlements. Rather than teaching, for example, agribusiness as a capitalist university would, they teach family agriculture with a critique of the exploitative and environmentally destructive techniques prevalent in contemporary agriculture. For other technical courses, the MST also helps people get educations in public universities, though they often win the collaboration of left-wing professors to offer more critical lessons of a higher caliber, even enabling them to design their own courses. They emphasize in all these forms of education that it is the responsibility of the students to use what they learn for their community and not for individual profit. The Movimiento Campesino de Santiago de Estero, Mocasa, is a group of farmers, many of them Quechua, with similarities and connections to the MST. Beginning as a group of farmers fighting for land in the face of expansion by forestry companies from the global north, they now number 8,000 families in 58 communities active in a broad range of struggles. Working together with the Universidad Transhumante, they set up a farmer's school that helps farmers learn the skills necessary for self-management. The students also learn to teach so they can help train other farmers. The Universidad Transhumante is interesting in its own right. It is a popular education university, also inspired by Freire, that organized a year-long caravan to 80 cities around Argentina to present popular education workshops and learn about the problems people face. 
Outside of the control of the state, education need not be a static, fixed thing. It can be a tool of empowerment, as people are taught how to teach so they can pass on the lessons they learn rather than being permanently dependent on a class of professional educators. It can be a tool of liberation, as people learn about authority and resistance and study how to take control over their own lives. It can be a caravan, a circus, as people travel across a country, and instead of bringing caged spectacles, they bring new ideas and techniques. And it can be a tool for survival, as oppressed peoples learn about their histories and prepare for their futures. In 1969, Native American activists organizing under the name Indians of All Nations occupied the abandoned Alcatraz Island, citing an ignored U.S. law guaranteeing that indigenous people had a right to occupy any land the settler nation abandoned. For six months, the occupation numbered in the hundreds. And though most left because of a government blockade, the occupation ultimately lasted for 19 months, revitalizing indigenous culture and rejecting colonial control. During the early period, the Indian occupiers organized a school that taught indigenous history and culture from their own perspective, without the racist propaganda that filled the textbooks of the government schools. For the duration of their occupation, they used education as a means of cultural renewal, whereas it had previously been used against them to destroy their identity and conscript the survivors of the genocide into the civilization that had colonized them. What about technology? Many people worry that the complexity of modern-day technology and the high-level integration of infrastructure and production in present-day society makes anarchy a dream of the past. In fact, this worry is not at all unfounded. It is not so much the complexity of the technology, however, that is at odds with the creation of an anarchist society, so much as the fact that technology is not a neutral thing. As Yuri Gordon expertly summed it up, the development of technology reflects the interests and needs of ruling members of society, and technology reshapes the physical world in a way that reinforces authority and discourages rebellion. It is no coincidence that the nuclear arms and energy infrastructure creates a need for a centrally organized, high-security military organization, and disaster management agencies with emergency powers and the ability to suspend constitutional rights, that interstate highways allow the rapid domestic deployment of the military encourage the transcontinental shipping of goods and private transportation via personal automobiles, that new factory jobs demand unskilled, replaceable laborers, who couldn't possibly hold the job until retirement, assuming the boss even wanted to give retirement benefits, because within a few years, occupational injuries from repetitive tasks or the unsafe pace of the production line will render them unable to continue. The subsidies and infrastructure provided by government tend to go towards inventions that increase state power, often to everyone else's misfortune, jet fighters, surveillance systems, pyramid building. Even the most benevolent forms of government support for invention, such as government subsidies to medical research, at best go to inventing treatments that are patented by corporations with no scruples about letting people die if they cannot afford them, just as they have no scruples over torturing and killing thousands of animals in the testing phase. The demands of freedom confront us with a much heavier choice than simply changing our decision-making structures. We will have to physically disassemble much of the world we live in and build it anew. Freedom, as well as the ecological balance of the planet, and thus our very survival, is incompatible with nuclear energy, reliance on fossil fuels such as oil and coal, and a car culture which estranges public space and fosters a system of exchange where most goods are not produced locally. This transformation will require a great deal of inventiveness. Thus, the relevant question becomes, will an anarchist social movement in society be inventive enough to carry out this transformation? I think the answer is yes. After all, the most useful tools in human history were invented before government and capitalism came about. Capitalism's so-called free market is said to motivate innovation, and market competition does contribute to the proliferation of profitable inventions which are not necessarily helpful inventions. Capitalist competition dictates that every few years all the old gadgets become obsolete as new ones are invented. So people have to throw the old ones away and buy new ones, at great detriment to the environment. Because of this planned obsolescence, few inventions tend to be well made or fully thought out in the first place, since they're destined for the trash from the beginning. 
The doctrine of intellectual property prevents the spread of useful technologies, allowing them to be controlled or withheld according to what is most profitable. Apologists for capitalism typically argue that intellectual property encourages the development of technology because it gives people the assurance, as incentive, that they can profit from their invention. What kind of cretin would invent something socially useful if he wouldn't get exclusive credit for it and profit from it? But the technological mainstays of our world were developed by groups of people who let their inventions spread freely and didn't take credit for them. Everything from the hammer to stringed musical instruments to domesticated grains. In practice, the capitalist economy itself disproves the assumptions about intellectual property encouraging innovation. Just like any other kind of property, intellectual property usually does not belong to those who produce it. Many inventions are made by wage slaves in laboratories who get no credit and no profit because their contracts stipulate that the corporation they work for receives ownership of the patents. The best people to develop useful innovations are the ones who need them, and they do not need government or capitalism to help them do this. Anarchists themselves have a rich history of inventing solutions to the problems they face. The anarchist bank robbers, known as the Bono Gang, invented the getaway car. Makhno, the Ukrainian anarchist, was the first to deploy highly mobile machine guns. He mounted them onto chonkies, the horse-drawn carts used by the peasantry, with devastating effect against superior foes bogged down in traditional tactics. In revolutionary Spain, after they had expropriated the big landlords, collectivized the land, and freed themselves from the need to produce a single export crop, Farmers improved the health of the soil and increased their self-sufficiency by intercropping. Specifically, growing shade-tolerant crops beneath the orange trees. The Peasant Federation of the Levant in Spain set up an agricultural university, and other agricultural collectives founded a center for the study of plant diseases and tree culture. In the highlands of New Guinea, millions of farmers live with high population densities in steep mountain valleys. Their communities are stateless, consensus-based, and until relatively recently, completely uncontacted by the West. Though they appeared as Stone Age primitives to racist Europeans, they have developed one of the most complex agricultural systems in the world. Their techniques are so precise and numerous that they take years to learn. Self-important Western scientists still do not know the reasons for many of these techniques, which they might dismiss as superstition were they not proven to work. For the past 7,000 years, the Highlanders have practiced a dynamic form of sustainable agriculture in response to impacts on their environment that might have caused less innovative societies to collapse. Their methods include complex forms of irrigation, soil retention, intercropping, and more. The Highlanders have no chiefs and make their decisions in long community discussions. They have developed all their techniques without government or capitalism the individual and group innovations communicated freely through a large, decentralized society. Many Westerners might scoff at the thought that people who do not use metal tools could provide a model of technological sophistication. These cynics, however, are simply benighted by Euro-American mythology and superstitions. Technology is not linking lights and whirring gadgets. Technology is adaptation. By adopting a complex set of techniques that have allowed them to meet all their needs without destroying their environment over 7,000 years, the New Guinea farmers have accomplished something Western civilization has never even approached. Still, there are plenty of anarchistic examples for the impressed by blinking lights crowd. Consider the recent proliferation of open source technology. Decentralized networks involving thousands of people working openly, voluntarily, and cooperatively have created some of the better forms of the complicated software on which the information age economy depends. The usual approach of major corporations is to keep the source or code for their software secret and patented, but open source software is shared so anyone can review and improve it. As a result, it is often much better and generally easier to fix. Traditional patented software is more vulnerable to crashing and to viruses, because a smaller pool of brains are able to check for weaknesses, and very few specialists are available to fix problems. Those technical support people you call on the phone when your computer operating system crashes don't get to see the code either. And beyond a little troubleshooting, all they can do is direct you to a cumbersome patch, or advise you to erase your hard drive and reinstall the operating system. 
Users of Microsoft products, for example, are no doubt familiar with their frequent glitches. And privacy advocates also warn of spyware and the cooperation between technology corporations and the government. Says one anti-authoritarian geek involved in the creation of open source software, quote, the best advertisement for Linux is Microsoft, unquote. Traditionally, much open source software has not been especially user-friendly, though generally this has to do with the fact that open source resides within, with all due respect, a geek subculture, and its typical users are highly computer literate. However, open source and participatory technology are steadily becoming accessible to an extent unprecedented by proprietary software. Wikipedia exemplifies this. Started recently, in 2001, on open-source Linux software, Wikipedia is already the largest and most accessed encyclopedia in the world, with over 10 million articles in more than 250 languages. Rather than being the exclusive domain of paid experts from a particular academic subculture, Wikipedia is written by everyone. Anyone can author an article or edit an existing article. And by allowing this openness and trust, it provides a forum for instantaneous, multiple peer review. The interests of the broader Wikipedia community of millions provide a self-regulating function. So vandalism, false editing, and bogus articles are quickly cleaned up. And facts lacking citation are challenged. Wikipedia articles avail themselves of a vastly greater body of knowledge than the small and generally elitist circle represented by academia. In a blind peer-reviewed study, it was judged to be as accurate as Encyclopedia Britannica. Wikipedia is self-organizing, and edited by an open body of peer-elected administrators. There have been a few publicized cases of intentional sabotage, such as when the televised news comedy show The Colbert Report rewrote history in one Wikipedia article as a gag for their show. But the prank was quickly fixed, as most false information on the site tends to be. A more lingering problem is posed by corporations who use Wikipedia for public relations purposes, tasking paid personnel to maintain a clean image in the articles about them. However, contradicting interpretations of the facts can be registered in the same article, and Wikipedia contains much more information on corporate misdeeds than any traditional encyclopedia. How will exchange work? There are many different ways exchange could work in a stateless, anti-capitalist society, depending on the size, complexity, and preferences of the society. Many of these are far more effective than capitalism at ensuring a fair distribution of goods and keeping people from taking more than their fair share. Capitalism has created a greater inequality in access to resources than any other economic system in human history. But the principles of capitalism that economists have indoctrinated the public to accept as laws are not universal. Many societies have traditionally used gift economies, which can take many different forms. In societies with a modest amount of social stratification, the wealthier families maintain their status by giving gifts, holding lavish feasts, and spreading their wealth. In some cases, they risk the wrath of others if they are not generous enough. Other gift economies are barely or not at all stratified. The participants simply disown the concept of property and give and take social wealth freely. In his diary, Columbus remarked with amazement that the first indigenous people he encountered in the Caribbean had no sense of property and gave willingly of all they had. Indeed, they came bearing gifts to greet their strange visitors. In such a society, no one could be poor. Now, after hundreds of years of genocide and capitalist development, many parts of the Americas have some of the starkest wealth gaps in the world. In Argentina, poor people initiated a massive barter network that grew enormously after the economic collapse in 2001 rendered capitalist forms of exchange unworkable. The barter system evolved from simple swap meets into a huge network involving an estimated 3 million members trading goods and services everything from homemade crafts, food, and clothing to language lessons. Even doctors, manufacturers, and some railways participated. An estimated 10 million people were supported by the barter network at its peak. The barter club facilitated exchange by developing a credit-slash-currency system. As the network grew and the capitalist crisis deepened, the network was beset by a number of problems, including people, often from outside the network, stealing or forging the currency 
several years later, after the economy stabilized under President Kirchner, the Barter Club shrank, but still retained a huge membership considering it was an alternative economy in a country that was once a model for neoliberal capitalism. Rather than giving up, remaining members developed a number of solutions to the problems they had encountered, such as limiting membership to producers so the network is only used by those who contribute to it. Contemporary anarchists in the U.S. and Europe are experimenting with other forms of distribution that transcend exchange. One popular anarchist project is the free store or giveaway shop. Free stores serve as a collection point for donated or scavenged items that people no longer need, including clothes, food, furniture, books, music, even the occasional refrigerator, television, or car. Patrons are free to browse through the store and take whatever they need. Many accustomed to a capitalist economy who come into a free store are perplexed by how it could possibly work. Having been raised with a scarcity mentality, they assume that since people profit by taking stuff and do not profit by donating, a free store would quickly empty out. However, this is rarely the case. Countless free stores operate sustainably, and most are overflowing with goods. From Harrisonburg, Virginia to Barcelona, Catalonia, hundreds of free stores defy capitalist logic on a daily basis. The Wegfinkel giveaway shop in Groningen, Netherlands, has operated out of a squatted building for over three years, opening twice a week to give away free clothes, books, furniture, and other items. Other free stores hold fundraisers if they have to pay rent, which would not be an issue in a completely anarchist society. Free stores are an important resource for impoverished people, who either are denied a job by the whims of the free market, or who work a job, or two, or three, and still can't afford clothes for the kids. A more high-tech example of free exchange is the relatively mainstream and wildly successful FreeCycle network. FreeCycle is a global network originally formed by an environmental nonprofit group to promote giving away items that might otherwise end up in the trash. As of this writing, they have over 4 million members grouped into 4,200 local chapters, spread through 50 countries. Using a website to post items wanted or items available to give away, people have circulated prodigious quantities of clothing, furniture, toys, artwork, tools, bicycles, cars, and countless other goods. One of the rules of FreeCycle is that everything has to be free, neither bartered nor sold. FreeCycle is not a centrally controlled organization. Local chapters set themselves up based on the common model and use the website on which the model is based. However, as it does come from a liberal nonprofit group without revolutionary aspirations, nor any critique of capitalism and the state, we can expect FreeCycle to have some problems. In fact, the organization accepts corporate sponsorship from a major recycling company and advertises on its website, and the chairperson has arguably slowed the spread of the FreeCycle idea by attacking various member groups or copycat websites with lawsuits or threats thereof for trademark infringement also by collaborating with the notoriously authoritarian Yahoo groups, to shut down local chapters for not adhering to organizational rules concerning logo and language. Naturally, in an anarchist society there would be no lawsuits for trademark infringement, and one chairperson would not be able to tyrannize a network that was maintained by millions of people. In the meantime, FreeCycle demonstrates that gift economies can function, even within jaded, individualistic Western societies, and can take new forms with the help of the internet. What about people who don't want to give up a consumerist lifestyle? Though an anti-capitalist revolution would create new social relationships and values, as well as free people's desires from the control of advertising, some people would probably still want to maintain a consumerist lifestyle demanding the electronic entertainment, exotic imported foods, and other luxuries that neocolonialism currently affords them. By routinizing the act of going to a shop, taking out your wallet, and buying a mahogany dresser or a bar of chocolate, capitalism creates the illusion that human beings naturally possess the ability to procure luxury goods that in actuality are produced by slaves on another continent. It takes massive infrastructure and multiple institutions of government and colonialism to afford this privilege to a select few. After an anarchist revolution, the slave labor camps that currently produce much of the world's chocolate and tropical hardwoods would no longer exist. 
if a person or a group of like-minded people wanted to surround themselves with the consumer goods they still craved, they would be perfectly free to do so. However, without a police force to make others bear the ecological and labor costs of their lifestyle, they would be the ones who would have to procure the resources, produce the goods, and remediate any pollution. Of course, they could make the process more efficient by specializing in one consumer good. For example, a union of chocoholics could produce eco-friendly chocolate, thus not damaging the ecological commons on which the rest of the society depends, and barter off some of that chocolate for, say, video entertainment equipment produced by a union of TV addicts. Why not? Ultimately, however, all that work and personal responsibility might not mesh with the consumerist mentality. The end result would be a union of producers. When people have to take responsibility for all the costs of their own actions, it removes the pathological insulation from consequences, which lies at the root of bourgeois whims. The result is carefully weighed, mature desires. In anarchist revolutions and stateless, non-capitalist societies throughout history, people used what they could make themselves or trade for from neighboring societies. In the Argentina factory takeovers, Various occupied factories began trading their products with one another, allowing the workers access to a variety of manufactured goods. In many of the collectives of the 1936 Spanish Revolution, communities decided together how much and what kinds of consumption they could collectively afford by replacing wages with coupons redeemable for goods at the communal depot. Everyone had a voice in determining how many coupons of various types a person could get and naturally they were free to trade their coupons with others, so someone who preferred more of one thing, say cloth, could get more by trading the coupons for something they didn't mind missing, like eggs. Thus, there is no imposition of Spartan uniformity, as in some communist states. People are free to pursue the lifestyle they want, but only if they can personally bear the cost of it. They are not able to exploit other people, rob their resources, or poison their land to get it. What about building and organizing large, spread-out infrastructure? Many Western history books assert that centralized government arose out of the need to build and maintain large infrastructure projects, especially irrigation. However, this assertion is based on the assumption that societies need to grow, and that they cannot choose to limit their scale to avoid centralization, an assumption that has been discredited many times over. And while large-scale irrigation projects do require some amount of coordination, Centralization is only one form of coordination. In India and East Africa, local societies built massive irrigation networks that were managed without government or centralization. In the Taita Hills region of what is now Kenya, people created complex irrigation systems that lasted hundreds of years, often until colonial agricultural practices ended them. Households shared day-to-day -day maintenance, each responsible for the closest section of the irrigation infrastructure, which was common property. Another custom brought people together periodically for major repairs, known as harambi labor. It was a form of collective, socially motivated work, similar to traditions in many other decentralized societies. The people of the Taita Hills ensured fair use through a number of social arrangements passed on by tradition, which determined how much water each household could take. Those who violated these practices faced sanctions from the rest of the community. When the British colonized the region, they assumed they knew better than the locals and set up a new irrigation system, geared, of course, to cash crop production, based on their engineering expertise and mechanical power. During the drought of the 1960s, the British system failed spectacularly, and many locals returned to the indigenous irrigation system to feed themselves. According to one ethnologist, quote, East African irrigation works seem to have been more extensive and better managed during the pre-colonial era. Unquote. During the Spanish Civil War, workers in occupied factories coordinated an entire wartime economy. Anarchist organizations that had been instrumental in bringing about the revolution, namely the CNT Labor Union, often provided the foundations for the new society. Especially in the industrial city of Barcelona, the CNT lent the structure for running a worker controlled economy, a task for which it had been preparing years in advance. Each factory organized itself with its own chosen technical and administrative workers. Factories in the same industry in every locality organized into the local federation of their particular industry, 
all of the local federations of a locality organize themselves into a local economic council, quote, in which all the centers of production and services were represented, unquote. And the local federations and councils organized into parallel national federations of industry and national economic federations. The Barcelona Congress of All Catalan Collectives on August 28, 1937, provides an example of their coordinating activities and decisions. The collectivized shoe factories needed 2 million pesetas credit. Because of a shortage of leather, they had to cut down on hours, though they still paid all their workers full-time salaries. The Economic Council studied the situation and reported that there was no surplus of shoes. The Congress agreed to grant credit to purchase leather and to modernize the factories in order to lower the prices of shoes. Later, the Economic Council outlined plans to build an aluminum factory, which was necessary for the war effort. They had located available materials, secured the cooperation of chemists, engineers, and technicians, and decided to raise the money through the collectives. The Congress also decided to mitigate urban unemployment by working out a plan with agricultural workers to bring new areas into cultivation with the help of unemployed workers from the cities. In Valencia, the CNT organized the orange industry, with 270 committees in different towns and villages for growing, purchasing, packing, and exporting. In the process, they got rid of several thousand middlemen. In Laredo, the fishing industry was collectivized. Workers expropriated the ships, cut out the middlemen who took all the profit, and used those profits to improve the ships and other equipment or to pay themselves. Catalonia's textile industry employed 250,000 workers and scores of factories. During collectivization, they got rid of high-paid directors, increased their wages by 15%, reduced their hours from 60 to 40 hours per week, bought new machinery, and elected management committees. In Catalonia, libertarian workers showed impressive results in maintaining the complex infrastructure of the industrial society they had taken over. The workers who had always been responsible for these jobs proved themselves capable of carrying on and even improving their work in the absence of bosses. Quote, Without waiting for orders from anyone, the workers restored normal telephone service within three days after heavy street fighting ended. Once this crucial emergency work was finished, a general membership meeting of telephone workers decided to collectivize the telephone system. Unquote. The workers voted to raise the salaries of the lowest paid members. The gas, water, and electricity services were also collectivized. The collective managing water lowered rates by 50% and was still able to contribute large amounts of money to the anti-fascist militia committee. The railway workers collectivized the railroads, and where technicians in the railroads had fled, experienced workers were chosen as replacements. The replacements proved adequate despite their lack of formal schooling, because they had learned through the experience of working together with the technicians to maintain the lines. Municipal transportation workers in Barcelona, 6,500 out of 7,000 of whom were members of the CNT, saved considerable money by kicking out the overpaid directors and other unnecessary managers. They then reduced their hours to 40 per week, raised their wages between 60% for the lowest income bracket and 10% for the highest income bracket, and helped out the entire population by lowering fares and giving free rides to school children and wounded militia members. They repaired damaged equipment and streets, cleared barricades, got the transportation system running again just five days after fighting ceased in Barcelona, and deployed a fleet of 700 trolleys, up from the 600 on the streets before the revolution, repainted red and black. As for their organization, quote, the various trades coordinated and organized their work into one industrial union of all the transport workers. Each section was administered by an engineer designated by the union and a worker delegated by the general membership. Each section was administered by an engineer designated by the union and a worker delegated by the general membership. The delegations of the various sections coordinated operations in a given area. While the sections met separately to conduct their own specific operations, decisions affecting the workers in general were made at general membership meetings. Unquote. The engineers and technicians, rather than comprising an elite group, were integrated with the manual workers. Quote, the engineer, for example, could not undertake an important project without consulting the other workers, not only because responsibilities were to be shared, but also because in practical problems, the manual workers acquired practical experience which technicians often lacked. Unquote. 
Public transportation in Barcelona achieved greater self-sufficiency too. Before the revolution, 2% of maintenance supplies were made by the private company, and the rest had to be purchased or imported. Within a year after socialization, 98% of repair supplies were made in socialized shops. Quote, the union also provided free medical services, including clinics and home nursing care for the workers and their families. Unquote. For better or worse, the Spanish revolutionaries also experimented with peasant banks, labor banks, and councils of credit and exchange. The Levant Federation of Peasant Collectives started a bank organized by the Bank Workers Union to help farmers draw from a broad pool of social resources needed for certain infrastructure or resource-intensive types of farming. The Central Labor Bank of Barcelona moved credit from more prosperous collectives to socially useful collectives in need. Cash transactions were kept to a minimum, and credit was transferred as credit. The Labor Bank also arranged foreign exchange and importation and purchase of raw materials. Where possible, payment was made in commodities, not in cash. The bank was a not-for-profit enterprise. It charged only 1% interest to defray expenses. Diego Abad de Santillán, the anarchist economist, said in 1936, quote, Credit will be a social function and not a private speculation or usury. Credit will be based on the economic possibilities of society and not on interest or profit. The Council of Credit and Exchange will be like a thermometer of the products and needs of the country, unquote. In this experiment, money functioned as a symbol of social support and not as a symbol of ownership. It signified resources being transferred between unions of producers rather than investments by speculators. Within a complex industrial economy, such banks make exchange and production more efficient, though they also present the risk of centralization or the re-emergence of capital as a social force. Furthermore, efficient production and exchange as a value should be viewed with suspicion, at the least, by people interested in liberation. There are a number of methods that could prevent institutions such as labor banks from facilitating the return of capitalism, though unfortunately, the onslaught of totalitarianism from both the fascists and the communists deprived Spanish anarchists of the chance to develop them. These might include rotating and mixing tasks to prevent the emergence of a new managing class, developing fragmented structures that cannot be controlled at a central or national level, promoting as much decentralization and simplicity as possible, and maintaining a firm tradition that common resources and instruments of social wealth are never for sale. But as long as money is a central fact of human existence, myriad human activities are reduced to quantitative values, and value can be masked as power and thus alienated from the activity that created it. In other words, it can become capital. Naturally, Anarchists do not agree on how to strike a balance between practicality and perfection, or how deep to cut in order to root out capitalism. But studying all the possibilities, including those that might be doomed to failure or worse, can only help. How will cities work? Many people believe that an anarchist society might work in theory, but the modern world contains too many obstacles that prevent such a total liberation. Large cities are chief among these putative stumbling blocks. Industrial capitalist cities are a tangled mess of bureaucracies supposedly only kept running by the authorities. But the maintenance of a large city is not as mystifying as we are led to believe. Some of the biggest cities in the world are largely composed of self-organizing slums stretching for miles. Their quality of life leaves much to be desired but they do show that cities do not simply collapse in the absence of experts. Anarchists have some experience maintaining large cities. The solution seems to lie in maintenance workers, taking over the organization of the infrastructure for which they are responsible, in neighborhoods forming assemblies so that nearly all other decisions can be made at a local level, where everyone can participate. It is probable that an anarchist revolution will be accompanied by a process of deurbanization as cities shrink to more manageable sizes. Many people will probably return to the land as industrial agriculture decreases, or ceases, to be replaced by sustainable agriculture, or permaculture, which can support a higher population density in rural areas. In such a period, it might be necessary to make new social arrangements in a hurry, but it won't be the first time anarchists have made a town or city from scratch. 
In May 2003, as envoys of the eight leading world governments prepared for the G8 summit in Avion, France, the anti-capitalist movement set up a series of connected villages to serve as a foundation for protest and an example of collective anti-capitalist living. These took the name Ve Alger, Village Alternatif, Anticapitaliste et anti -guerre. For the duration of the mobilization, thousands of people lived in these villages, organizing food, housing, child care, debate forums, media, and legal services, and making decisions communally. The project was widely regarded as a success. The VRG also exhibited the dual form of organization suggested above. Specific neighborhoods, each with fewer than 200 people, organized around a community kitchen, while village-wide services, quote-unquote, inter-neighborhood collective spaces, such as the legal and medical space, were organized by those involved in providing those services. This experience was replicated during the 2005 mobilizations against the G8 in Scotland and the 2007 mobilizations in northern Germany, when nearly 6,000 people lived together in Camp Redelich. These protest villages had precedence in the German anti-nuclear movement of the previous generation. When the state wanted to build a massive nuclear waste storage complex at Gorleben in 1977, local farmers began to protest. In May 1980, 5,000 people set up an encampment on the site, building a small city from the trees cut for construction and naming their new home the Free Republic of Vinland. They issued their own passports, set up illegal radio shows and printed newspapers, and held common debates to decide how to run the camp and respond to police aggression. People shared food and did away with money in their daily lives. One month later, 8,000 police assaulted the protesters, who had decided to resist nonviolently. They were brutally beaten and cleared out. Subsequent manifestations of the anti-nuclear movement were less inclined to pacifism. In England, a yearly festival of travelers and hippies that converged at Stonehenge to mark the summer solstice became a major countercultural autonomous zone and an experiment in quote-unquote collective anarchy. Beginning in 1972, the Stonehenge Free Festival was a gathering that lasted for the month of June until the solstice. More than a music festival, it was a non-hierarchical space for the creation of music, art, and new relationships, as well as spiritual and psychedelic exploration. It became an essential ritual and social event in England's growing traveler culture. By 1984, it drew 30,000 participants who created a self-organized village for the month. In the words of one participant, it was, quote, anarchy, and it worked, unquote. The Thatcher regime saw it as a threat. In 1985, they banned the 14th annual Stonehenge Free Festival, brutally attacking the several hundred people who came to set it up in an assault known as the Battle of the Beanfield. These examples of impromptu camps are not as marginal as they might seem at first. Hundreds of millions of people throughout the world live in informally organized cities, sometimes called shanty towns or favelas, which are self-organizing, self-created, and self-sustaining. The social issues posed by these shanty towns are very complex. Millions of farmers are forced off their land yearly and have to move to the cities, where the peripheral shanty towns are the only place they can afford to settle. But a great many people also move to the city voluntarily to escape the more culturally rigid rural areas and build a new life. Many shanty towns are plagued by health problems caused by poor access to clean water, health care, and nutrition. However, many of these problems are peculiar to capitalism rather than the structure of the shanty towns, as the inhabitants are often ingenious in providing for themselves, in spite of artificially limited resources. Privatized electricity and water are generally too expensive, and even where these utilities are public, the authorities often refuse to provide access to these informal settlements. Shanty dwellers get around this problem by constructing their own wells and pirating electricity. Medical care is highly professionalized in capitalist societies and distributed in exchange for money rather than on the basis of need. Consequently, there are rarely fully trained doctors in the shanty towns. But the folk medicine and healers that are present are often available on a basis of mutual aid. Access to food is also artificially limited, because small scale horticulture for local consumption has been replaced by large-scale production of cash crops, depriving people throughout the global south of diverse and affordable sources of local food. This problem is exacerbated in famine areas, 
because food aid from the U.S., in line with military and economic strategies, consists of imports rather than subsidies for local production. But within the settlements, available food is frequently shared rather than traded. An anthropologist estimated that in one informal settlement in Ghana, people gave away almost one-third of all of their resources. This makes perfect sense. Police rarely have control of shanty towns, and some armed force is required to uphold an unequal distribution of resources. In other words, those who hoard resources are likely to be robbed. With few resources, little security, and no guarantees of property rights, people can live better by giving away a large portion of whatever resources they come across. Gift-giving increases their social wealth, friendships and other relationships that create a safety network which cannot be stolen. In addition to mutual aid, the anarchist objectives of decentralization, voluntary association, hands-on production rather than professionalization of skills and services, and direct democracy are guiding principles in many shanty towns. It is also important to note that, in an era of growing environmental devastation, shanty town dwellers subside on just a fraction of a percent of the resources consumed by suburbanites and formal city dwellers. Some may even have a negative ecological footprint in that they recycle more waste than they generate. In a world without capitalism, informal settlements would have the potential to be much healthier places. Even today, they disprove the capitalist myths that cities can only be held together by experts and central organization, and that people can only live at today's population levels by continuing to surrender our lives to the control of authorities. One inspiring example of an informal city is El Alto, Bolivia. El Alto sits on the Altiplano, the plateau overlooking La Paz, the capital. A few decades ago, El Alto was just a small town, but as global economic changes caused the shutting down of mines and small farms, huge numbers of people came here. Unable to reside in La Paz, they built settlements up on the plateau, changing the town into a major urban area with 850,000 residents. Seventy percent of the people who have jobs here make their living through family businesses in an informal economy. Land use is unregulated, and the state provides little or no infrastructure. Most neighborhoods do not have paved roads, garbage removal services, or indoor plumbing. 75% of the population lacks basic health care, and 40% are illiterate. Faced with the situation, the residents of the informal city took their self-organization to the next step by creating neighborhood councils, or juntas. The first juntas in El Alto go back to the 50s. In 1979, these juntas started to coordinate through a new organization, the Federation of Neighborhood Councils, the JUVE. Now there are nearly 600 juntas in El Alto. The juntas allow neighbors to pool resources to create and maintain necessary infrastructure, like schools, parks, and basic utilities. They also mediate disputes and levy sanctions in cases of conflict and social harm. The Federation, the JUVE, pools the resources of the juntas to coordinate protests and blockades and constitute the slum dwellers as a social force. In just the first five years of the new millennium, the JUVE took a lead role in establishing a public university in El Alto, blocking new municipal taxes and deprivatizing the water services. The JUVE was also instrumental in the popular movement that forced the government to nationalize the natural gas resources. Each junta typically contains at least 200 people and meets every month, making general decisions through public discussion and consensus. They also elect a committee which meets more frequently and has an administrative role. Political party leaders, merchants, real estate speculators, and those who collaborated with the dictatorship are not allowed to be committee delegates. More men than women sit on these committees. However, a greater percentage of women take on leadership roles in Vejuve than in other Bolivian popular organizations. Parallel to the organization in neighborhood councils is the organization of infrastructure and economic activity in unions or syndicates. The street vendors and transportation workers, for example, self-organize in their own base unions. Quote, both the neighborhood councils and their counterparts in the informal economy are patterned after the traditional communitarian organization of rural indigenous communities, ILU, 
in terms of territoriality, structure, and organizational principles. They also reflect the traditions of radical miners' unions, which for decades led Bolivia's militant labor movement. Fusing these experiences, El Alto's migrants have reproduced, transplanted, and adapted their communities of origin to facilitate survival in a hostile urban environment. Through the neighborhood juntas, El Alto has developed as a self-constructed city run by a network of microgovernments, independent of the state. In Raúl Zubechi's view, the autonomous organization of labor in the informal sector, based on productivity and family ties instead of the hierarchical boss-worker relationship, reinforces this sense of empowerment. Citizens can self-manage and control their own environment. Unquote. Horizontal networks, quote-unquote, without traditional leadership, also play a major role complementary to these formal structures in both the organization of daily life and the coordination of protests, blockades, and struggle against the state. Now that Bolivia has an indigenous president and progressive government led by MAS, the movement towards socialism, the Juve faces the danger of incorporation and recuperation that typically neutralizes horizontal movements without explicitly anti-state goals and means. However, while supporting Evo Morales' reversals of neoliberal policy, as of this writing, Fejuve remains critical of MAS and the government, and it remains to be seen to what extent they will be recuperated. In South Africa, there are many other examples of informal urban settlements that organize themselves to create a better life and struggle against capitalism. Specific movements of shack dwellers in South Africa are often born out of moments of violent resistance that take on an extended life as people who met in the streets to stop an eviction or a water shutoff continue to meet in order to create structures for home care for the sick, fire watch, security patrols, burial services, education, gardens, sewing collectives, and food distribution. This was the case with the movement Abelali Basm Jondolo, which arose in 2005 out of a road blockade to stop the eviction of the settlement to make way for the development and preparation for the 2010 World Cup. The Symphony Way Settlement of Cape Town is a squatted community of 127 families who had been forcibly evicted from their previous home by the government which is trying to meet its 2020 target under the Millennium Development Goals to eradicate all slums. The government relocated some of the evictees in a tent camp surrounded by armed guards and razor wire, and the rest in the transit relocation areas, described by one resident as, quote, a lost place in hell, unquote, with high crime and frequent rape of children. Refusing to negotiate with the highly distrusted political parties or to live in either of the officially provided hellholes, the Symphony Way families decided to illegally occupy an area along a road to set up their community. They organized their community with mass assemblies in which everyone participates, as well as a high degree of individual initiative. For example, Rays, a nurse who lives in Symphony Way, volunteers as a teacher within the community center helps organize a girls' netball team, a boys' soccer team, a drum band, a children's day camp during the holidays, and assists in childbirth. Children are very important within the settlement, and they have their own committee to discuss the problems they are confronted with. Quote, In the committees, we solve our everyday problems when children fight or something. We come together and talk. There are children from other settlements, not only from this road, unquote, explains one member of the committee. The community is multiracial and multireligious, including Rastafarians, Muslims, and Christians, who work together to foster a culture of respect among the different groups. The settlement has a night watch to discourage antisocial crime and put out unattended fires. The residents told a visiting Russian anarchist that they felt much safer in their community than they would in one of the camps offered by the government where crime is rampant, because at Symphony Way, the community worked together to protect itself. Quote, when someone is in trouble, everyone is here, unquote, explained Reyes. The sense of community is one reason why the squatters do not want to move to a government camp, despite the threat of police violence, and even though in the tent camp the government provides food and water for free. Quote, the community is strong, and we made it strong, living and working together but we didn't know each other when we first came here. This year and a half made us all a big family." Unquote. There are thousands of examples of people creating cities, 
living with a high population density, and meeting their basic needs with scant resources, with mutual aid, and direct action. But what about the bigger picture? How would densely populated cities feed themselves without subjugating or exploiting the surrounding countryside? It may be that the subjugation of rural areas by cities played a role in the emergence of the state thousands of years ago, but cities do not have to be as unsustainable as they are now. The 19th century anarchist Peter Kropotkin wrote about a phenomenon that suggested interesting possibilities for anarchist cities. Urban gardeners in and immediately around Paris supplied most of the city's vegetables via intensive agriculture supported by plentiful manure from the city as well as industrial products such as glass for greenhouses that was too costly for farmers in rural areas. These suburban gardeners lived close enough to the city that they could come in every week to sell their produce at market. The spontaneous development of this system of gardening was one of Kropotkin's inspirations in writing about anarchist cities. In Cuba, centralized industrial agriculture collapsed after the fall of the Soviet bloc, which had been Cuba's main supplier of petroleum and machinery. The subsequent tightening of the U.S. embargo only exacerbated the situation. The average Cuban lost 20 pounds. Quickly, much of the country shifted to small-scale, intensive urban agriculture. As of 2005, half of the fresh produce consumed by the 2 million residents of Havana was produced by about 22,000 urban gardeners within the city itself. The Parisian example chronicled by Kropotkin shows that such shifts can also occur without state guidance. What about drought, famine, or other catastrophes? Governments assert additional control through quote-unquote emergency powers, on the premise that greater centralization is necessary in emergencies. On the contrary, centralized structures are less agile in responding to chaotic situations. Studies show that after natural disasters, most rescues are carried out by common people, not government experts or professional aid workers. More humanitarian aid is offered by people than by governments. Government aid often facilitates political agendas such as supporting political allies against their opponents, spreading genetically modified foods, and undermining local agriculture with huge shipments of free food that are quickly replaced by commercial imports, monopolizing the upset market. For that matter, the significant portion of the international arms trade is disguised in government aid shipments. It is possible that people would be better off in catastrophes without governments. We can also develop effective alternatives to government assistance based on the principle of solidarity. If one anarchist community is struck by a catastrophe, it can count on help from the others. Whereas in a capitalist context, catastrophe is an occasion for politically motivated forms of aid, if not outright opportunism. Anarchists give assistance freely, with the assurance that it will be reciprocated when the time comes. Spain in 1936 again provides a good example. In Mas de las Matas, as in other parts, the cantonal, or district committee, kept track of shortages and surpluses, and made arrangements for even distribution. Part of its work was to make sure all collectives were taken care of in the event of natural disasters. Quote, For example, This year the principal crops of Mas de las Matas, Seno, and La Ginebrosa were destroyed by hailstorms. In a capitalist regime, such natural disasters would have meant endless privations, heavy debts, foreclosures, and even emigration of some workers for several years. But in the regime of libertarian solidarity, these difficulties were overcome by the efforts of the whole district. Provisions, seeds, everything needed to repair the damage, were furnished in the spirit of brotherhood and solidarity, without conditions, without contracting debts. The revolution has created a new civilization. Unquote. Anarchism is one of the few revolutionary ideas that does not require modernization. Anarchist societies are free to organize themselves at any sustainable level of technology. This means that societies currently existing as hunter-gatherers or groups of people who choose to adopt such a lifestyle can practice this most efficient and ecological form of subsistence, the most conducive to a resilient ecosystem that is less vulnerable to natural disasters. Meeting our needs without keeping count. Capitalism has produced some amazing gadgets, 
but the military and the police are almost always the first to use new technologies, and often the wealthiest people are the only ones who benefit from them. Capitalism has produced undreamed of wealth, but it is hoarded by parasites who did not produce it, and who lord over the slaves and wage laborers who created it. Currently, the 85 richest people in the world have as much wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion combined. Competition may seem to be a useful principle for encouraging efficiency, but efficiency for what purpose? Beneath the mythology it has created, capitalism is not actually a competitive system. Workers are divided and played against each other, while the elite cooperate to maintain their subjection. The wealthy may compete for bigger slices of the pie, but they regularly take up arms together to ensure that every day the pie is baked and brought to their table. When capitalism was still a new phenomenon, one could describe it more honestly without being confused by decades of propaganda about its supposed virtues. Abraham Lincoln, hardly an anarchist, could see clearly enough that, quote, capitalists generally act harmoniously and in concert to fleece the people, unquote. Capitalism has failed horribly at meeting people's needs and arranging a fair distribution of goods. Throughout the world, Millions die from treatable diseases because they cannot afford the medicine that would save them, and people starve to death while their countries export cash crops. Under capitalism, everything is for sale. Culture is a commodity that can be manipulated to sell lingerie or skin cream. Nature is a resource to be sucked dry and destroyed for profit. People must sell their time and energy to the owning class in order to buy back a fraction of what they produce. This is a deeply rooted system that shapes our values and relationships, and defies most attempts to abolish it. The socialist revolutions in the USSR and China did not go deep enough. As they never fully abolished capitalism, it reemerged stronger than before. Many anarchist attempts have not gone deep enough either. Capitalism may well have resurfaced in these experiments, if hostile governments had not crushed them first. Power and alienation must be pursued to their roots. It is not enough for the workers to own their factories collectively if they are controlled by managers and the work still reduces them to machines. Alienation is not simply the absence of legal ownership of the means and fruits of production. It is the lack of control over one's relationship with the world. Worker ownership of a factory is meaningless if it is still administered by others on their behalf. The workers must organize themselves and control the factory directly. And even if they control the factory directly, alienation persists where the broader economic relationships, the factory itself, dictates the form their labor takes. Can a person truly be free working on an assembly line, denied creativity and treated as a machine? The form of work itself must change so that people can pursue the skills and activities that give them joy. The separation of work from other human activities is one of the roots of alienation. Production itself becomes a sort of obsession that justifies exploiting people or destroying the environment for the sake of efficiency. If we view happiness as a human need no less than food and clothing, then the division between productive and non-productive activity, between work and play, melts away. The squatting movement in Barcelona and the gift economies of many indigenous societies provide examples of the blurring of work and play. In a free society, exchange is simply a symbolic assurance that everyone is contributing to the common resources. People don't hoard resources or take advantage of others, because they have to give in order to receive. But exchange can present problems by attaching a quantitative value to every object and experience, thus stripping them of their subjective value. Where once an ice cream cone was worth a delicious ten minutes of finger-licking goodness in the sun, and a book was worth several afternoons of enjoyment and reflection and possibly even life-changing insight. After these goods are assessed according to the regime of exchange, an ice cream cone is worth a fourth of a book. Further into this process, to make the exchanges more efficient, while consequently fixing the quantitative value as inherent rather than comparative, an ice cream cone is worth one unit of currency, and a book four units of currency. The monetary value replaces the subjective value of the object, the pleasure people find in it. 
On one hand, people and their desires are taken out of the equation, while on the other hand all values, pleasure, usefulness, inspiration, are absorbed into a quantitative value, and money itself becomes a symbol for all these other values. In effect, possessing money comes to symbolize having access to enjoyment or the fulfillment of a desire, but money, by affixing a quantitative value, robs objects of the sense of fulfillment they might bring, because humans cannot experience quantitative, abstract value. In eating an ice cream cone, the pleasure is in the act, but in buying a commodity, the pleasure is in the purchase, in the magical moment that an abstract value is transformed into a tangible possession. Money exerts such a powerful influence on notions of value that consumption itself is always anticlimactic. Once the commodity is purchased, it loses its value, especially as people come to prioritize abstract value over subjective value. Furthermore, having purchased it, you lose money, and your total holdings of symbolic value decrease, hence the nagging feeling of guilt that accompanies spending money. In addition to alienation, exchange creates power over. If one person accumulates more quantitative value, they have accrued the right to a greater portion of the community's resources. Systems of exchange and currency, like the barter network in Argentina or the coupon system for purchasing goods in parts of anarchist Spain, rely on customs and social arrangements to prevent the reemergence of capitalism. For example, a gift economy could function at a local level, with exchange used only for regional trade. People could deliberately set up work environments that encourage personal development, creativity, fun, and self-organization, while decentralized federations of such workplaces could award one another with coupons for the goods they produce, so each person has access to the wealth created by all. But it is a worthwhile challenge to do away with exchange and currency altogether. Within free stores or free cycle, the symbolic assurance provided by exchange or barter is unnecessary. The assurance that everyone will contribute to the common wealth springs from the culture of the spaces themselves. As a participant, you express the desire to give and to receive, and your inclusion in the social space increases as you carry out both of these activities. In such contexts, giving pleases a person just as much as receiving. The world is bountiful enough to provide for everyone's needs. Scarcity is a dangerous illusion that functions as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once people stop giving and begin hoarding, collective wealth declines. If we overcome the fear of scarcity, scarcity itself disappears. Common resources will be bountiful if everyone shares and contributes, or even if most people do. People like to be active, to create and improve things. If people are ensured access to common resources and spared the poverty of wage slavery, they will create plenty of the things they need and that give them pleasure, as well as the infrastructure required to make and distribute these things. Recommended Reading Sam Dolgoff, The Anarchist Collectives, New York, Free Life Editions, 1974 Natasha Gordon and Paul Chatterton, Taking Back Control, A Journey Through Argentina's Popular Uprising, Leeds, UK University of Leeds, 2004. Michael Albert, Parakan, Life After Capitalism, New York, Verso, 2003. Peter Kropotkin, Fields, Factories, and Workshops Tomorrow, London, Freedom Press, 1974. Jacques Smith, Anurata, and Joe Nasser, Urban Agriculture, Foods, Jobs, and Sustainable Cities, UNDP, Habitat 2 Series, 1996. The Curious George Brigade, Liberate, Not Exterminate, New York, Crime Think, 2005. Gonzalo Casanova, Armarse sobre las ruinas, Historia del Movimiento Autónomo en Madrid, 1985-1999, Madrid, Potencial Hardcore, 2002. VVAA, Colectividades y Ocupación Rural, Madrid, Traficantes de Sueños, 1999. Marcel Maus, The Gift, 
Forms and Functions of Exchange in Archaic Societies, 1924. English Version, London, Rutledge Press, 1990. P.M. Bolo Bolo, Zurich, Paranoia City Verlag, 1983. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.